Thank you for waiting for us. Our next guest is no stranger to television. You've seen him and you loved him from such shows as Star Trek Voyager and Next Generation, 24, Sopranos, and Dollhouse. And that's just a little bit. Please welcome our next guest, our own Dr. Morales, Jonathan Del Arco.
to have been able to get to this point requires tremendous compromise, precision, and economy. And all the women I know who are in powerful positions in the government or in the corporate sector or wherever it is have had a similar experience. So that's one thing that I do feel I learned as Laura Roslin that I find is also available to me in Sharon Gray. Uh, for me, it wasn't really other characters I played, but uh, was the thing I brought to the character was really myself, because James wrote it with me in, in his mind. So there were elements of the humor of the character that were our own, my own particular humor. I like to say Dr. Morales is me after one cocktail. <laughs> one martini. Just to be specific, one martini. Uh, very much to the point, says what he's thinking and feeling, and, and, uh, and after one martini, I, we can all attest, I will. Uh, and so it's really my own personal life uh, was, was used more. Um, prior to that, I was playing other gay characters that were much more uh, stereotypically flamboyant, if you will. This was not required of this role, and I really love that about it, so in the same way that Mary was saying about empower, women being empowered by being strong. I think as a gay male, being empowered by being great at your job, not by the fact that you're incredibly funny. Um, <laughs> and sometimes bitchy. Um, and there's children here, I shouldn't say that word. Uh, whatever. I think they've heard it. <laughs> so, um, I, so really my own life really informed the character more than other roles I played. Um, this is actually more of a comment. When Sharon um, talks to her older son and tells her tells him how disappointed she is and about the adoption of Rusty, my husband was just coming home and even he stopped watching. We both looked at each other and went, yes! Because <laughs> when you're raising kids, your kids always sit there and tell you, there's no other parent that's like you. I was like, that's it! That was such validation for us as parents. Oh, that's great. Uh, and it was just so nice to see that. <laughs> You know, I really liked, you know what I liked about it? Um, because, you know, the relationship with Rusty is very specific and has had uh, so many extraordinary qualities to it, and so many beautiful things, but it requires a carefulness because he's not my son and he's had a background that I don't understand and I never wanted to drive him away, I never wanted to panic him. But I raised this other kid. And I know him inside and out, and I know what he's made of. And he just wasn't being himself. And I just was not going to let that pass muster. And, and when I read it, I just called James Duff and said, this is completely right on. This is how you raise kids. You know? When your kid isn't living up to what they are, and you don't give it to them. Do you know what I'm saying? then you're not doing your job. That's how I feel. So thank you for that comment. I, I was thrilled too. It's one of my favorite scenes of the season, and some of your best work too. I, I, at the table read, it was so moving to watch Mary be, be mom, you know, and be strong mom, loving mom, but saying, I'm so disappointed in you, you know, and it's, uh, it's a great, great, amazingly written scene that came out so awesome. So. Thanks. It's exciting. You know, my favorite line in that scene, though, and I wish I'd played it earlier in the raising of my own children, is it's better than what I'm thinking of calling you right now. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a great line. Well, and you were such a little yeah. huh, saying things like lonely, lonely. I know. And then you don't you say like from the bottom of my lonely heart. <laughs> from the bottom of my ever so, so lonely, lonely heart. heart. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm so lonely. She made her loves her life. Yeah. You know, it's so cool. And Dr. Riley's loves his. He has a good time. Oh, yeah. yeah. I bet. Yeah. I want to go out with him one night. Yeah, I think. I want to go with Dr. Riley. Sharon and Ray and Dr. Riley's go party. And I want to see what he does after work. Oh, you know what I do. <laughs>
just slightly at all, if at all possible. Um, but my question is, speaking of Rusty and kind of the dynamic with all of the police force, um, some of the dynamics are really cool. The how, you know, the Rusty dynamic, and also I love the dynamic between like Sykes and um, I can't think of his name, G.W. Bailey's character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. I'm just, you know, I think it's funny because, you know, um, he's talking about always, I mean, from episode one, he was talking about, I'm going to retire now and all of that. Um, I think it's so funny. How do you guys feel about how they've turned all of the dynamics around and evolved all of the characters? What are your thoughts? Because we love it. Well, it was amazing to watch. It was amazing to watch the transition from closer to major crimes. Um, and there were, there were very specific artistic things that the creative team did beyond our work as actors that were genius. One was obviously the introduction of the greater as the antagonist than the hero. So that transition was really flawless and seamless. Also creating this sort of sense of like Brenda going away, but she's still somewhere near in the universe with, you know, with, with uh, so there were all these elements, and then the rest were, were, were the character developments of characters you already, uh, had already known. The really interesting thing that most people don't realize is um, the way the show was filmed for the closer. It was Kira's, it was from Kira's perspective almost, and, and everyone else was kind of peripheral. With this, it's really about her and about Provenza and about each individual story. And so the camera work is a little closer to us. We're not as far we're not as far apart. You see much more of us, you know. And I think that that's the technical element that created the intimacy. So you, so you think you're seeing more of us, but in fact you are. But, but we've always delivered that. You just the camera wasn't necessarily on us as much, you know. And you know what? If, if I can add yeah. to that is. One of the reasons it worked organically is that one of the things James and I talked about was that Sharon Rader's management style is inclusive, and she's a delegator, and she draws people out. And that's something he and I were both interested in, um, because that is something that women are bringing to leadership roles that isn't quite the same as what maybe some men bring. <laughs> I mean, and so right then we've got a conversation between two actors that, that is drawing out their dynamics as well, their gifts as detectives, more specifically than the last show. So we're happy about that. Yeah, it's great. It's actually also, in, a, in some ways, a much more realistic portrayal of the police department because you do make deals and you have to work with people, right? I mean, so. Hey, great, I've got a question for y'all. Um, it kind of dovetails into what we just had. You guys had such a great ensemble cast. I mean, absolutely perfect. You guys so much experience with everyone that's on the screen. If you could comment about what's, what's working like in that ensemble environment, and I wouldn't mind, other than John, perhaps I suspect is probably one of the pranksters, who is the next funniest person on the show? Offset. Wow. Yeah. Describe funny. <laughs> Funny annoying, funny great. <laughs> uh, you mean like um, the, the person? person? Like, like backstage? backstage? Yeah. 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 Um, John Tenney's pretty funny. John Tenney. Yeah, John Tenney, Tenney, John Tenney, Tenney kind of wins the funny one. John Tenney wins it. He's the impossible to work with. You, you don't ever want to be in a room with John Tenney. He loves never. rehearsal. <laughs> He's well, first of all, he loves rehearsal. We can't get him out of rehearsal. Yeah. But then, once, once his coverage is done, He's, He's very funny. funny. Yeah. And I, I, I can't even look at it because I won't get my work done. <laughs> yeah. we, all, we all have a sense of humor, but um, the, I would say the vibe, we've all been together for many years, really, even us, we weren't there from the very beginning. Um, so we all know each other, and a lot of us socialize throughout the year, we go to each other's weddings and Christmas parties, and so we see each other a lot, so we're all friends. Uh, so there's that fun, friend feeling uh, backstage um, and behind the camera and um, yeah we're just you know sometimes it's a slog because you got to get through the, the long episode and 
I'm extremely fortunate because I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of days learning my technical technical babble, but I'm usually in and out in one day. So I'll come back three weeks later, and it's like the dynamics have completely changed. I'm like, what's been going on, Mary? <laughs> Fill me in. Uh, I always do this and go, oh, thank God I'm in the morgue today. <laughs> it's all. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun work environment. It's very familial, you know, it's like a big family. All right, this question is for Mary. Um, really sort of applicable to your entire career, not just major crimes, but um, you've suffered a lot of personalized loss in your, in your life, and has, um, has acting been sort of an outlet for um, recovering from that and, and really being able to move on? Do you, have you used that? I think one of the uh, gifts of being an actor is that not only do you have naturally um, the ability to somehow contact your emotions, but um, which can sometimes be seen like you grow up as, oh, the sensitive kid or, or the dramatic kid. But in fact, it just means that you have access to feelings. So when you are a professional actor, you have the opportunity to activate those feelings, to sort of mutate them into a different form, and thereby um, express them. And I find that that's really, for me, one of the great gifts of it, because people in general are afraid of their feelings. And they're afraid to grieve, and they're afraid to be vulnerable, myself included. And honestly, if I didn't do this, I'd be out of my mind. Um, I already am. But I mean more out of my mind. So, yes, I do think it does help. Uh, it is a gift for us to be able to process the losses of life through our work. Um, and I think you're a uh, fantastic actress and robbed of an Emmy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear the other one. Oh, I, I said you're robbed of an Emmy. Say it again, please. <laughs> I think she said you've been robbed of an Emmy. Your role is Laura Roslin. I just, I can see a picture of you and Emma Stone and like Emma Stone and Laura Roslin. I just can't imagine myself being Laura Roslin. And like, I can see a picture of you and Eddie and like, I cry because like Roslin and Donna is like an epic love. And then on Major Crime, Sharon and Rocky and Sophie and Heartwarming and also makes me cry. Um, and so I was just wondering if you watch, you know, your work, you watch your shows, and if you can appreciate the kind of emotion that you bring to other people, um, you know, because you know your background, you know, because Thank you for that, about that EMMY thing. Um, <laughs> oh, well. Uh, I don't watch my work much. I check in when I need to. I, I really need to look at this or that. I really need to look at lighting. I need to hear the sound of this character's voice, or I want to look at a particular scene, or someone says to me, I have to. I do watch the show eventually, but it's usually when we're on hiatus. I go back and I look at it all. And I learned this a long time ago. I'm not one of those actors that can keep an eye on herself while she's doing it because I have a very fast, critical mind. And if my mind gets engaged when I'm working, uh, I'm cooked, and I can't be present. So I don't watch a lot, but thank you. Do you watch a lot? What do you do? I'm such a narcissist. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, that's awful. Well, that's pretty good. God, I look like shit. Oh, now that outfit. No, I, I do like to watch. <laughs> I do, I'm a watcher. I like to watch. And, and it's, um, it's not easy to watch yourself, but um, I, I watch myself critically, but it doesn't affect me when I go back somehow. Um, most of the times when I'm shooting, I'll know if I've sort of gotten to a place I wanted to get to and seen it. I like watching the show. I'm a fan of the show as well. And since I'm not in every episode, I watch it all, right? So, um, so I keep, that's how I keep up. I try not to read the scripts I'm not in so I can sort of be kind of a fan and sort of be like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Um, which is tricky when you go 
out, you go shoot something and you're out of order, you know, you go, oh, what, what's going on here? Um, but no, I, I, I'm comfortable watching. Yeah, I'm fine. It's weird, we were talking about this yesterday, the weirdest thing about being an actor having been on television for a long time is watching your aging process. It's bizarre, because even within, even within having done the show for eight years, and I look at, like, the early, like, late at night when the closure's on, and back then I thought I looked terrible, you know, in that light. I'm like, I look so much better then in that light than I do now! <laughs> That's exactly the thing I had this conversation with my assistant. Yeah. Because we were pulling out my pictures to get them ready to go to Dragon Con. And I started looking at them and I go, God, I'm having, I feel so old today. I just, God, look, I actually look good then. And I didn't know it. I didn't know it. And now, and she said, okay, hold on. Do you understand? That you're doing the same thing. Right. You can't see yourself in the present. So I said, oh, okay, so you finish my pictures. <laughs> I'm going to go do something else. You also can't see yourself as others see you. No. Which usually is much better than you see yourself. Right. <laughs> Interestingly enough. I know. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting being an actor. I think, sorry, Rob, Rob Lowe said being famous, which he, he is, was a, uh, a series of bad haircuts. <laughs> a series of bad haircuts. Because of all the photos of himself, you know? Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I guess I feel like I should start with I'm here because your performances have both been so great from the closer, and my parents will kill me if I don't convey their compliments as well. They're not really dragon con people, but they love major crimes. We love parents. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask about, this was touched on a little earlier, but how much of deliberate looking back to the beginning of The Closer was there at the beginning of Major Crimes? Because it seemed like some of the same patterns with someone new taking over were repeating, and that's and Sharon goes from being the foil to Brenda to in parallel with her. I thought it was interesting. Are you saying how much of the show is sort of... Uh... Was there any from, from the actors or from the writers of deliberately looking back at the beginning of the I don't think so. Fresh, fresh. You yeah, look all together. No. But I think if, if a woman takes over in any kind of corporate or otherwise position, you're going to run into some of the same issues. Meaning, we were just talking about this backstage. Uh, you simply have to get used to and figure out how to overcome the fact that if a man tells people to do something, they're more apt to just do it. And that's just how we're conditioned. So, so whatever conflicts a woman has coming into a new situation are going to have a parent. I wish I could sing and start singing. It's a man's world. <laughs> W-O-M-A-N. <laughs> so I think you both great. I have a question for each of you, sort of. So, Dr. Morales, I am very impressed by your method jargon. There's nothing more that I hate than watching an Emmy who does not know what they're talking about. Right. Or, like, or like a doctor who just says the wrong thing. I'm like, you wouldn't push that or that. Yeah. So, I, Mandy, did you have to go through any sort of like special like medical jargon? Medical At school? Class? I should have. <laughs> no. Um, here's the funny thing about medical jargon. I, Spanish is my first language, and a lot of the do a lot of medical jargon is Latin-based. So when I read things, I completely understand what they are because they're Latin-based, so that I, I know the origin of the words, so that will help, and how to pronounce them. Learning them, on the other hand, while conducting an autopsy, with a poor person in, in dead man costume makeup on a table, with my fellow actors who are all looking at me because I'm doing a presentation on something I know nothing about, while having an attitude about it and being pissed at something or other as a character, it's really tough. <laughs> it's really tough. And these guys, they look at me at some days when I have like two pages of like explaining all the stuff and they're just like, blah, blah, blah. and it takes me days to learn it. I, I understand it, but to learn it, wow. He's really so good. It's uh, part of why I look forward to them more because I know he'll be doing all the talking. Yeah. Because he, he will have these passages that do. We just simply would not. We would not be able to pull them off. And all we say is, really. They do. 
and then it goes on and on. And we go, and what do you think? <laughs> and he's, he, it's quite amazing to watch him. And he gets better, that's the other thing. He gets better and better at it. He's getting better at it. He's not, like, these people have been doing this show for a long time. And I am blown away by the fact that everybody's work is growing. That's such a tribute to success. You have to recommit every time. I mean, it, it, every year that the show gets renewed, we're all so grateful for Joss, because not all our friends are Joss in, in LA. And, you know, you just go, okay, yes, would I rather be doing uh, a Rusty and Sharon scene in the house? Yes, I want to be the Rusty and Sharon. But I have to be at the morgue, it's my job. <laughs> Um, emotional work is much more fun for me to do, you know, things that are of, of a human nature are, are a lot easier than, than medical jargon. But I think we find a way to bring that into it, so it's, it's a challenge, it's really a challenge. But thanks for the compliment. I'm not really a doctor, though I, I do at times feel that I am. Well, I commend you on your, your quick research. Uh, Sharon, this question is for you. I was... I love that you just did that. I really think that's great. That's never happened. Thank you. Oh, well. Sharon. So, the first time I ever saw you on TV was when you were the antagonist in The Closer. And I think ever since then, I've just been really mesmerized by your voice and the cadence in which you speak and your enunciation. And I just wondered, did you go through any sort of voice? I mean, I just... You speak like no one else on TV, so the cadence and the enunciation is just, so did you do anything to make that happen? Well, um, when I was a little girl in Pennsylvania, I came, where'd you go? Oh, uh, there you go. I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, I'm talking to you, sir. I don't know if you saw my last show, Battlestar Galactica, but there was something called an airlock. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania in a very Irish neighborhood, you know, third generation immigrants and what have you, so I think way back there, some of that was laid in. And then when I was in college, I spent a year studying in England, and I, I absorbed a lot of that sound, and I did voice training there, and then some more in the States, and and then I worked, as you all know, in Canada forever on the best ship, Galactica. <laughs> and uh, Canadians, uh, some people think I'm Canadian. So it's a little bit mixed up with Canadian, Irish, and English. And I don't know why, really. It's not, I guess, thank you. Oh, well, that's what I meant. I really like you. Will you just kind of follow me around? Oh, my God. I thought I had the queen speech. <laughs> you do? Well, that's, that's the eye roll cadence. Like, ugh. We're just a couple of queens. Yeah, we you? are. Thank I you. Love anyway. you so much. You are You're released. released. Did you guys, did you guys see this? This was 
on the John Oliver show last week tonight. And I the thing that I loved about it the most, it was a segment on the fact that women are underpaid, which is hasn't changed. Hello. And so one of his solutions after all the statistics was to create a dollar bill with women on it, but it was only worth 83 cents. <laughs> and he said, like this, we can have a dollar bill with Gina Davis. Like this, we can have a dollar bill with Ju Julia Louis Dreyfus. Then he said, or like this, we can have a dollar bill with President Laura Rosler. <laughs> Because he loves Battlestar. Do you know what I mean? So I did see it. I did see it. I tried to tweet it, but I'm so bad at tweeting. I don't know where I sent it. Someone retweeted it. As you all know, I struggle with social media. Um, but yeah, I did see it. I, I loved it. I, I did too. Um, so the actual question I wanted to ask, uh, I would say that Major Crimes is more than a lot of procedurals for me. It's one that I really enjoyed for the the character, the main cast dynamics, more so than the plot of the week. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times the plot of the week kind of passes me by. Like, I look up and they're interviewing that guy, and I don't really know why, but it's fine. <laughs> he didn't do it. I know, I know there was a line where someone explained it, but I missed it. Um, but every now and then there, there are, like, episode plots that stick with me, and I would say the recent for us one, where, like, the women are getting kidnapped from the bars, and then fed horse milkshakes and sold to the human hunting farm in Mexico, which whole bit I thought never really went anywhere. Uh, it just kind of sticks in my mind. So I was wondering for you guys, are there plots of the week that really stick out in your memories, either for good reasons or for bad reasons? Uh, for, I guess was it this season? The seasons are starting to blend, but uh, there was one just difficult one recently or last or late last year, uh, the transgender uh, girl that yeah, the boy that got murdered. Uh, it was just so disturbing on every level, on the family level, on the human level, and the, the, the fact that it's such a misunderstood uh, thing in our culture, you know, and the tragedy that and we were all very sad that week. That one really affected everyone really, really deeply. And the uh, Oh, we have amazing artists that create some of the bodies. Sometimes we don't have actual people. Usually it's an actor. Uh, they did an amazing head of the, of the child with a wound. And we, it was reverential, really. Like, the feeling in the morgue that day felt like, like you were paying respects to a body. That's how amazing the artistry of this guy that did the piece was. So, yeah, that, that one really hit us all uh, really hard. For, that was really hard for me. I think that, um, for my taste, I, I have an attachment to the episodes such as this one that, that are really what I call um, issue-centric, you know what I mean? It isn't a random murder or somebody got mad at their wife, it's a, you know, not that those murders aren't tragic, they are, but when we actually go into a social issue, that's when I think we all get very excited about it.
something they had going. And when we talk about it, we talk about you are a true, you know, you're that true person. So it's quite That's so nice. We appreciate it all that you do. So, so tell me, great spin-off psychic. <laughs> How are you feeling about the coroner? <laughs> Don't let me down, sister. <laughs> Maybe you could be the new Jack Klugman? No, uh, 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 But he played Quincy? He played Quincy? Oh, we have, we do, we do have a little inside joke, should I tell them? What, what my show would be called if, if I, I was? Mr. Queensy. <laughs> Mr. Senor Queensy will be the name of my show. No, I'm just teasing. Yeah, you had it. You were right on it. Okay, Mr. Queensy. Very good. But thank you so much. And I also want to say that we rarely get the kind of talent that you bring and the kind of show that you bring uh, to Dragon Con. We get many, many sci-fi people, but we rarely get something that's not sci-fi. So thanks for coming. But 
or the first uh, episode of Major Crime. But given that we've had time to understand her more as a woman and understand a little bit about her vulnerability, whatever it is, then when you bring Dart back, it's, it's rooted in all these other things. And when she was Star Trader in The Closer, we didn't know anything else about her. So I've been really tickled by the potential there. I just say that. Yeah. Question for each of you for Jonathan. Based on your personality, you must have a good story about trying to reanimate one of your corpse actors during a scene. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. We, we, had a, we, had, we had our share of interesting actors playing the corpses. Um, we had one young guy who fell asleep. <laughs> it was a very long day in the burrito room. You know, the, they call the burrito room the where they're stacked, you know? And we had one up on the shelf, and we're all shooting, and we hear <laughs> <laughs> This guy had been asleep for like eight hours. I think he was like young, so I think he'd partied the night before. Um, no, I mean, you know, for the most part, <laughs> we have great sympathy for them because they're laying on a metal tape table, so I haven't had to be too mean. Her Mary Friendly had the chocolate with the nongs in the desk drawer, so what's in Sharon's desk drawer? I can't say. But I bet you it's in mine too. So real and honest and, and skilled 
uh, and looked young enough, um, to be able to pull this off, do you know what I mean? And anyway, thank you, we're thrilled. Part of it is me. Um, part of it is, because uh, I do do a lot of weird little things with her that I've noticed. And I think part of that is, is what you don't know about yet, but you will someday. Sharon has a huge emotional life. It's, it, it, it's amazing. She has systematically trained herself to keep it down, keep it under wraps. Um, her marriage, or whatever that was, <laughs> 30, 30 years, uh, there's some history there that has not allowed, or she has not felt fully able to um, be free with all the energy that floods up and down. So, fidgeting. Darting, eye darting, is, I discovered with her. It's like when she thinks, her eyes go blue. <laughs> and I like it because uh, she's always looking to stay ahead of what's going on. Um, so some of it is me that I do that too, but most of it is really using it as Sharon because I've, I found out very early on what was really underneath there with her. And it's not fully expressed. So all of that fidgeting is what is how we hold it all in. If you know what I mean. Like if I really cut this right now, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. So thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm actually a brand new fan. I have never seen you in anything else. And I really love the show. And um, I just wanted to say that your voice, you, your voice has been talked about before. And what, like when you're talking to Rusty, told you something horrible, and this voice that yes, it's horrible, but we're going to find a way to fix it. <laughs> and it's, it's just such a mom voice, and, and I've started using that with my kids. I work with, uh, with teenagers, and it's, it's just the perfect cadence for, yes, this is horrible, but we're going to fix it now. I, I, I thank you for that. I see a self-help uh, tape career. <laughs> I do. Can you imagine Mary guiding you through a meditation? I'm down. I'm gonna get through without laughing. Take a deep breath. You can do it. I've had a lot of good therapists in my life. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Hayes. I'm a fan of the show. I love the show. Um,
and the coroner's office is full of immigrant doctors. A lot of doctors that, um, you know, that's the best job they could get in the state, having come from another country. Um, so he was very adamant about it representing LA on every level. And the, as you know, the guest stars are also from different, like, the stories in, you know, are from different communities. Asian community, black community, Latino community. And that's Los Angeles. I mean, LA is a huge city with a lot of cultures, and he was very, he's very adamant about casting it that way. So, yeah. So, I, I think this is probably one of the best ensemble shows on TV. I, I, look I agree. To, uh, I look forward to seeing everybody up here next year, hopefully. Um, the two quick questions. The first one, uh, who are your favorite characters in the show to interact with? And uh, the second question would be, can we hope to see Brenda in a cameo at some point in the future? I think that you can hope. <laughs> we hope. Yeah. Um, I don't, I wouldn't answer who's my favorite character if you paid me. <laughs> it's like saying, who was your favorite leading man to kiss? Uh-uh. It's not going to happen. I love interacting with all of them. I really do. And uh, I really have a favorite. I'll tell you this one. I'm really fond of Raiders, not Lord. <laughs> so, but... Yeah. You know, there are some that are your favorites to work with, you know, per se, but like Mary said, we're not going to deny you. Um, you know, we, we all love each other. We, we all have relationships, you know, with each other, so it's always fun to see one another. Character-wise, I think they're all kind of fascinating, because they're all, they're all a part of Ed James' mind, really. They're, a lot of them, sometimes you watch an actor and you'll be like, oh, that's James's." X side, you know what I mean? Like, because he really uses all of himself in the different parts of, of the show. So, I was just thinking, like, more care, not the actors, no, but the characters. Like, because Buzz is, I think Buzz is hilarious, and you guys crapped all over him for a long time and ruined his Prius. And so, I mean, is he, is he a fun guy, you know, a fun character to interact with? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I also want to say, uh, someone else who uh, my parents love the show and I love the show. It's great to have something you can talk about together every week. Um, I just want to say, G.W. Bailey. Uh, I've only known him as like you know the wacky, bad, evil character he played in the whole you know police academy and things. And uh, he is such a treasure on the show. And I wonder if you could talk about working with him because he just seems like the most hilarious person. He's, he's the sweetest drunk. grump in the world. <laughs> He's a wonderful actor. He's a very skillful, um, funny, funny man. Very funny man, and he's got great training. And so he's he's very smart to work with as an actor. He's a lot of good uh, technique. Very funny, very generous, and and sometimes sleepy in a good way. And it's hilarious. Yeah. He's great. He's everything you think. He is. He really, he really delivers a lot of himself in that role. Um, and the the soft side of GW is, you know, he, he runs a, a nonprofit for children with cancer. So he brings the kids out, and we're very involved with Sunshine Kids. Um, he's just a sweet, sweet man. So that's that that part you don't really see as much in Provenza that often, but it comes out, you know. Um, I'm definitely one that's more interested in the characters than the crown of the week, and Provenza's character, the uh, character Provenza makes me laugh every week. Uh, and I know. I, I, but I think uh, the writers have missed an opportunity between him and Julio. Uh, my favorite scene from the entire both shows is when Julio got shot again this season. Yeah. And, and it's, it's comment that he made. But I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for the writers to, to have Provenza pick at him or protect him in a weird way uh, in, in future scenes. We'll, we'll tell them. We'll tell them. You're yeah. Right. I'm sure Raymond will be thrilled to hear that. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, something that's not on the schedule, Mary's going to do photo op, and I'm going to go join her for some. So if you end up over there, I'll be there as well for a little bit. So anybody who's coming to, if you are coming up, you do, um, to the Walk of Fame. Um, everything that I uh, earn this weekend is being donated to Santa Clara University on the Roosevelt Reservation in South Dakota. And there's some fans out here already who, as you can see, are very invested. It's an amazing, amazing, wonderful thing, wonderful place, and very, very important to the Native American community. And it is on the reservation in South Dakota. Most of the people who played extras and dances with wolves and played smaller parts and my language teacher from dances are from the Rosebud, so it's very dear to my heart, so please come visit me. When am I going where? Oh, I'll be back there by 1.32. We have to do photo ops, and then we'll go back. Yeah, so around 1.32, and please come. Please come. You've been great!